Senator Begich presently serves as chairman of the Subcommittee on Oceans, Atmosphere, Fisheries, and Coast Guard within the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. Senator Begich joined us for Capitol Hill Ocean Week last year, and we're very honored to welcome him back again this year. With that, Senator Mark Begich. Thank you very much, and uh, I have to say, last time I was here, it was, you've really upscaled. You got incredible lights, video technology. Last time I was here, the room was different. I was up front and I came in with an injured eye uh, that I was barely able to see anything I had written down. So I first thank you for not having me injured this year. Uh, but uh, second, uh, it's always good to be here to talk about the oceans and what's going on. And for your work on Capitol Hill and Oceans Week and making sure uh, that folks who may not have an ocean in their backyard literally are aware of the impacts and economic values. And I just got introduced to your panel. I think you're going to have a great panel, a lot of variety of what's important about the oceans and, and the economic value. And sometimes when you think about the ocean, at least a lot of times we talk about it, it's always about uh, the environmental issues, which are very important. But there's so much more uh, to our oceans, maybe the fisheries, may it be the shipping, uh, in my state and other states, in the Gulf, oil and gas development, uh, tourism, uh, you name it, it's happening within our ocean. So looking at it from a holistic uh, point of view and even wind energy, tidal energy, all these pieces fit uh, under oceans. Recently, not only do I chair the subcommittee on oceans, I chair a committee called the steering committee. And I might have mentioned this last year, I can't remember the timetable we did this, but we actually held for the Democratic majority a uh, meeting to talk about the economics of the oceans. And it was interesting to see what members showed up, some that haven't had an ocean in millions of years, but they were there because they are intrigued about what's the potential, what does it mean, what's happening. And in my state, obviously, there's a lot of activity with our oceans, and more recently is what's going on with the Arctic. And uh, there are some big issues out there. Uh, for example, the law of the sea, and where we cross our fingers every day that we can actually get to a rational discussion on this. Um, when you think about it, I always, back home when people ask me why, why haven't we signed on the law of the sea and who else hasn't signed, and I pause and I say, well, here's the company we keep, Libya, uh, Iran, and North Korea, and us. And people look at me astonished by the fact that we have not signed, as you know, uh, negotiated uh, over 20 years ago uh, a lot of tweaks over time, but as we move forward, especially what's happening in the Arctic, for us not to be uh, signatory to the law of sea is a huge mistake. And we know there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, I, I know the report on um, ocean policy just came out today, and law of the sea is one of their main priorities. They are helping in many ways to help clarify the misinformation. It's important that we have this ratification at some point. I know when people, when I talk to people, they always say, well, the people who are opposed to it, well, we're giving up our sovereignty, they, we give up our rights. And actually, every day we don't sign this treaty, we're giving up our rights, our sovereignty, our ability to manage our oceans as we see uh, what's appropriate for us in our waters. And I know Senator Kerry is working aggressively uh, through the Foreign Relations Committee, starting this process of, which I think is a great move, educating uh, the public and members uh, where and who supports the law of the sea. And when you see people from the business community, you see people from the environmental community, you see people from the military community, you see communities that uh, are next to the coasts of our waters, all those unified, uh, it's amazing to see, it's a rare thing to see that many different groups that may be conflicting, conflicted on other issues, but on this one, uh, they're unified. So we'll see as progress goes forward. I know once we start heating it up some more, uh, there'll be a lot of debate on uh, is it the right thing, should we do it now? I can only tell you it is the right thing and we should do it. From the Arctic, and I, and I want to just mention this, and, and again, your panel is, uh, again, has a lot more information on a variety of other issues, but I want to talk about the Arctic, and there's great controversy at times about the Arctic, but here's the reality. So we are going to see the Arctic developed in some form or another. The question is, how do we manage it? How do we manage it for the right reasons? As you know, we're not, we don't allow fishing up there right now, but we probably see potential fisheries in the future. There's no mineral exploration, uh, but there could be. Uh, oil and gas is happening. There's actually, for those that may not be aware of this, uh, we already have visitors 
coming to the Arctic. And they're literally stopping in on cities and communities like Barrow and Nome. And, and let me put it in perspective, if you've never been to Barrow, there really is no port. Uh, you cannot just drive a ship up and dock. It is impossible to do. Um, so we are seeing people who are actually showing up. Antarctica last year had 40 plus thousand visitors to it. When people figure out that they can visit the Arctic and not only see something very unique, but also the unique culture up there, the subsistence hunters, the uniqueness of our Alaska Native communities, you're going to see a lot of visitors. So it's, and we now see a lot of shipping. We see a massive movement of a variety of elements in the Arctic. And we can battle all the time on Arctic, or we can figure out how to do it right. And this is what we spend a lot of our time on. Uh, as someone who was born and raised in the state, uh, understands we've introduced multiple pieces of legislation about protecting the Arctic, how to manage it, making sure the, uh, the right kind of activity occurs up there, ensuring that our subsistence hunters, our subsistence users who live off the sea, they live off the Arctic. It is not some theory, it's not some uh, something in a book, it's actually real. And we have to make sure their food supply continues for generations to come, as it has for over 10,000 years already. So it's an interesting moment in our history and, and how we manage that. So a lot of the work you all are doing, first at these panels, but also what you do on the Hill, educating folks about the oceans. As you all know, the Arctic is one of those pieces. Actually, I'm amazed some of my colleagues, uh, I think I've just discovered that the Arctic exists. Uh, and so when I talked to them about it, I'd say, you know, it, it's not just ice all the time. There's actually a lot of activity going on there. And we got to do the right thing for generations to come. So first. Uh, thank you for allowing me to say a few comments. I know uh, we intend and we're hoping uh, to put together a hearing at some point on the report on ocean policy. Uh, it's important to take that document and let more people understand it. Um, we're going to continue to be very active in the Oceans Committee, subcommittee, bringing issues to the forefront uh, and educating people on what's uh, happening with their oceans. And the last, I said that was the last thing, but one other thing we're dealing with right now, we had a great hearing a couple weeks ago on marine debris. And this is a very troubling thing for us in Alaska, but also on the West Coast. Uh, not only the, what I call the normal debris that's coming, you know, it's, hard, it's awful to say that, you know, that normal debris is, I don't want to say it's accepted, but we know it's coming. But then when there's a catastrophic incident, such as what happened in Japan, <coughs> when this issue is moving debris to the West Coast and to Alaska, and we'll have uh, temporary and long-term impacts. Because some of that debris is not going away overnight and it's not going to be cleaned up as easy. We had, an, I think, a very important hearing a couple of weeks ago to get folks, and I'd say folks outside of the nonprofit community that's already engaged in this issue, but the administration to really focus on this and why uh, this is a slow, prolonged disaster. It's not something that happens like a hurricane or an earthquake where the day it happens, the next day you can see it. This will happen over a period of time. And if we don't plan for that, and start to prevent as much as we can and clean up what's occurring, we will see over time a, a large accumulation of, of areas, especially I can tell you in Alaska where we already see it, starting to accumulate. Or when a ship appears, a ghost ship literally appears off the coast of Canada uh, that no one was tracking, no one knew it was there until they literally flew over it and then spotted it. That's a serious problem with our ability to manage this ongoing and growing problem. I will tell you, I will be very supportive on many of the issues you're focused on and working on. You can count on the Oceans Committee to be aggressive about educating our members and the country on the importance of our oceans and doing whatever we can to preserve them, not only for this generation, but for generations to come. Thank you all very much for allowing me just a few minutes to give a couple comments. And again, thank you to the panel. and Thank you all for all the work you're going to do on the Hill to help us educate folks on what's important about the oceans. Thank you all very much.